Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Um, I would like to welcome you guys in unlocking and increasing foreign direct investment for Sudan. And before lifting the US sanction on Sudan expansion was really costly process for Sudanese businesses as they are faced with significant barriers in terms of flows and reflows of capital. While the removal of the sanction presents an opportunity for both investors and Sudanese companies bridging the gap, bring new challenge and barriers to overcome. This, this session will discuss the following various ways and opportunities for investors to enter the new market, which I mean Sudan, opportunities for business in Sudan and how to access funding sources to raise capital and leverage new funding mechanism, potential barriers and risk that would hinder investors from investing in Sudan and how to overcome such challenges. The role of policy, public support and incentive mechanism to bridge the gap for foreign investment. Finally, the opportunities and challenges for SMEs in Sudan and horizons. I will be your moderator today my name is Ramil Bagher. Let me welcome the best expertise in this area. Mr. Majdi Amin, the senior advisor to Minister of Finance, Minister of Finance and Economic. Mr. Mohammed Osman, managing partner, African Catalyst Investment. Mrs. Nina Said, co-founder and CEO, Souq.com. Finally, Mr. Amr Zakaria, the founder of Madarik Capital. I will start by, by you, Ms. Nina Said. If you please give us some introduction about yourself and welcome the audience. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm very happy to be attending this webinar. Thank you very much to 249 Startups for organizing this. Um, I think the timing of this series is very good as the country begins to open up. Um, and implement a number of economic reforms that will hopefully pave the way to a more investor-friendly business environment. Um, uh, so I'll just introduce myself very quickly. Uh, as Rami said, I am the, the CEO of Alsuq.com, uh, which is Sudan's largest online classifieds marketplace. Um, I also sit uh, on the board of Said Group uh, as a head of strategy, so I have my fingers in the FMCG pies as well as in the mining sector um, and in agriculture. Thank you, Nina. Uh, let me start again. I will go over for Majdi, Mr. Majdi Amin, to introduce himself, please. <clears throat> thank you, Rami, and thank you to 49 Startups. Uh, I know everybody's probably looking forward to getting on with Chelsea and Man City, so I'm going to make it quick. Uh, I'm senior advisor for the Ministry of Finance. I work on the economic reforms. Uh, private sector and financial sector as well. Um, I was with the Omidyar Group for about a year and a half investing in technology um, and I spent two decades in the World Bank Group. The last thing I did was the head of corporate strategy for IFC. Thank you, looking forward to the conversation. We're very glad to have you here, Mr. Majdi, today. Uh, it's over to you, Mr. Mohammed Osman, please. Introduce uh, thank you very much, Rami. It's a pleasure to be part of the session, and I would like to thank the team from 249 Startups for organizing the session. A brief introduction. My name is Mohammed Yusuf Bakr Osman, and I'm a co-founder and a managing partner at the Africa Catalytic Investment Partners, ASIP. And ASIP is a Dutch-based investment advisor in a capital raising firm. And we bring significant global investment experience in frontier and developing uh, markets with a solid track record in sustainable investments across various sectors and asset classes. I am leading the firm's origination, business development, investor relations and strategic and catalytic initiatives. Uh, prior to ASIP, I was a private equity and venture capital senior consultant at the Green Climate Fund for six years. And there I led the design structuring uh, and structuring of several private equity funds um, in developing countries and emerging markets. Uh, I'm Swiss educated and currently based in Sudan. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed, and we're glad to have you here. Mr. Amro Zakaria, please. Mike is all yours. Thank you, Rami. Um, you know, happy to be with you all, and thank to 249 Startups. Uh, Amro Zakaria, I, um, uh, I've been working uh, for a couple of Wall Street firms uh, since 2011, uh, both publicly traded companies. And uh, for the past um, you know, eight years, I've uh, uh, set up a boutique advisory firm where I work with uh, just different stakeholders that include um, you know, central banks, uh, commercial banks, exchanges uh, like NASDAQ, for example, uh, on basically how to engage better in the global markets. And um, for the past two years, we kind of engaged in, um, uh, we started to get active in the uh, VC area, uh, VC domain and uh, private equity domain. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Mr. Ambrose Zakaria. Uh, I will keep continuing with you with the first question for this session. Due to the solid experience that you were, you're having in the brokerage industry, as well in the club <clears throat> and the capital market, what's your take for Sudanese capital market? What are the key challenges that we, we, the market will face? And what are your recommendations for during the transitional period and beyond, as we are facing a lot of ups and downs. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think uh, I think the uh, uh, Sudanese capital market is it has a lot of potential. Um, however, it has been shackled uh, during the time of Al Bashir for you know probably so many reasons. Maybe because uh, it has been used for um, uh, you know as a mean to a kind of uh, maybe uh, you know funnel money or or um, you know, wrestle control of different uh, companies without, you know, without people noticing. Um, like, and I, I realized that in the last two years after the Saura, it seems like there is a new, um, uh, you know, new set of management. And there are a lot of, you know, young men and women, they're you know, amazing and brilliant and, and full of energy. And they really want to kind of change uh, the, the, uh, the capital markets in Sudan. And they want to do whatever it takes. So one of the things that uh, I had the privilege, the privilege of uh, working with them and meeting with them, and just I, made, I just made suggestions uh, from what I've seen in different um, uh, kind of frontier markets. So if you look at the at financial markets, they're divided into, uh, you know, you have capital markets, you have equities markets, you have commodities markets. And I, I think the, the, for example, the Khartoum Stock Exchange has a lot of potential in, in, uh, in bringing in a lot of foreign direct investments. Only because, as investors, uh, when they are able to go through a you know like a like a regulated uh, exchange uh, with the rules being very clear to everybody, uh, rules of engagement and disengagement, then that kind of lowers the risk for investors to go into a country, uh, and that will help a lot. Uh, we have um, a lot of um, uh, like if we look at the classification of uh, equities, you know, equities stock markets. You have developed, developing, and then you have frontier markets. Some of the frontier markets are very close to us, like Kenya, for example. The, the market cap of publicly listed companies in frontier markets is about $750 billion. So there are, a lot, there are trillions and trillions of dollars that are uh, managed in passive uh, investment funds. So if we are able to just focus on getting the Khartoum Stock Exchange to be classified as a frontier market, then there is you know, automatically we're going to have you know at least hundreds of millions of uh, of dollars in liquidity that will come to um, uh, to companies that are listed in, you know on the exchange on the Khartoum Stock Exchange. The nice thing about it is really it's not magic and it's not subjective. It's just there is a, a clear roadmap or uh, you know that that can help us uh, to get to that classification. And I think they already started uh, you know, with the help of with Artel Malia and you know make this team and everybody else. Uh, that they're putting these steps, um, uh, you, know, you know, separation, for example, of uh, yeah, the, the, the authorities, uh, the regulator is separate from the, uh, from the, from the operator. Uh, so all these things will, will help get us there, inshallah. That's, 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 that's really, really amazing. But you've mentioned something about Majdi's team. So I would, uh, I would like to hear from Majdi if he can give us some insights or highlights about what's happening for the, uh, for the new challenges, how are they going to mitigate them? All right. 
today. Yeah, thank you, Rami. <clears throat> Good question, and I uh, definitely agree with, uh, with Rami. Um, well, I'm going to start by saying that I don't believe right now that Sudan's goal is actually to attract FDI. And I know that's the topic of the panel. I believe our goal is to increase exports, to create jobs, and support private sector led economic growth. Um, I think we're in the early stages of an economic turnaround. And FDI will play a key role in, in economic growth and fueling that turnaround especially in sectors like infrastructure, technology, financial sector, and, and those sectors that support a growing middle class. And I think the middle class growth will eventually be a driver of, of a lot of investment. But I think our focus right now is really to create an investment climate that enables the growth of all firms, especially the domestic private sector and SMEs. Um, the ministry strongly believes in the level playing field where it doesn't matter where you're from or what size firm you have or whether you're well connected or not connected. Everybody needs to have a, have a fair shot and there's a lot of work required um, to get there. Um, I think right now the biggest deterrent to investment in Sudan is uncertainty and risk and uh, to some extent cost. Um, rather than the size of the opportunity. And we've been out of disconnected and isolated for a long time. Um, money is coming in through the public sector, at least $2 billion this year from uh, just one of the multilateral development banks. So there will be more. The margins are high traditionally in sectors, in, in places like Sudan and Sudan in many sectors, margins are high, but not many firms can deal with the costs and the risks generating your own power. Some firms get hit with high taxes, some pay none. It's an investment climate that needs a lot of work. Um, so what are we doing about it? Um, with the issues risk, you have to think you know, sort of broadly, how, how do we address the drivers and certainties of risk? First of all, peace. You know, the what government has done about peace has lowered political risks dramatically. And uh, that was certainly a deterrent for many, many years. Inflation. One of the, you can't really invest if you have no idea where things are going price wise and we're still in it. But the underlying driver of inflation is the budget deficit, monetization, massive subsidies. We've been working on it and we've, we should see the results of that second half of this year. Um, currency risk. So currency unification has mitigated and undercut this problem that companies had with dealing with like multiple currency practices, it's hard to keep track of how many currencies we actually had. Um, the country as a whole, as a, as a thriving sort of opportunity from a, as if you think of a country as a company, it's not the same, but we're about to have a dramatic reduction in the external debt of the country. Um, so our, you know, credit rating, we're not rated yet, but if you were to think about it that way, our risk as a country from a credit standpoint is go dramatically going to improve when we go through the HIPAA process. Um, we're working on financial sector reform. Very hard for an SME to do well when you can't get access to finance because the banks need to you know, restructure and recapitalize. We're working through that. Um, SOE reform, um, anti-corruption, one-stop shop, a real one-stop shop, not just physically, but actually where, you, the, where the, the government does the processing behind the scenes rather than every, in every company. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about it later, but I think one, one thing we're about to launch, at least the minister would like to move through it and getting the process of consultation is a public-private dialogue forum so the government and the, and, and, and the private sector and key sectors can sit and work through each of the issues that face them in sector by sector. So, uh, you know, I think we're in the middle of a turnaround, the early stages of a turnaround, a lot of work, a lot is getting done, but it takes going to take all of us working to get it right. Thank you. Well, well, well that's really, that's really brilliant. Just know that we're, we're at least going through the same, or at least having, um, bridging our own issues. Uh, and would like to hear about them, of course, uh, later in, in, uh, in uh, 
and other questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Muhammad Uthman, Mr. Majdi here mentioned something about capital structure and the challenges that we are we're going through. And due to the experience of, I, I think you, you have a highlight to, to do to this uh, question here, as to wrap it up, it's the final question in this session. Will you please just give us some of um, your um, experience in the complex capital structure? Sorry, I was mute. Uh, well, I think I think it brings so much joy to my heart uh, to hear uh, such positive news from uh, Mehdi. Um, I believe there is a lot that is going on at the moment, um, uh, specifically to the questions the, to the question that you just asked right now. There are many answers one could give, uh, but let's look at some of the examples of structures that that may probably bridge this gap. Um, and, and let's look at them in, in two ways from a public perspective uh, in specific, uh, namely risk absorption and, and transfer mechanisms, and two, uh, they could be institutional capital structures. So in terms of uh, institutional capital structures, for example, uh, a sovereign wealth fund would allow for uh, effective and efficient use of uh, public capital to incentivize the, the, the private sector in one hand, and allow for significant capital to be raised across sectors as well. Um, and uh, an additional example could be to establish uh, a fund of funds or sectoral focus type of funds. And those are uh, commercially driven structures that would really allow to package investment opportunities on rather portfolio basis and allow for capital mobilization both at the fund level and, and projects level uh, at an attractive uh, mobilization ratio. Uh, what's important to mention here as well that uh, these fund structures are the type of structures that are mostly preferred by institutional investors, uh, those who have money, because then they approach investment opportunities and risk from a portfolio basis than on single transactions. Uh, here as well, uh, you see that it could allow uh, the government to efficiently and effectively use public funds available and attract investors at scale uh, by, for example, dedicating a layer or a ratio of risk capital to the overall size of, of these fund structures. And these are just simple examples. Uh, on the other hand, where we mentioned, uh, for example, risk absorption and transfer mechanisms, and these are structures such as uh, guarantee facilities that may allow to provide a push or provide a buffer to the government's uh, unpresent credit rating, as, as, as Mehdi referred. Uh, and, and this uh, first by providing first loss and, and credit enhancement type of guarantees. And this is where you also see the international community itself coming handy uh, uh, and attaching themselves into these structures through uh, their enhanced credit ratings. Uh, these are several institutions, there are several institutions as well uh, that could be of great support to such, uh, such approach. In conclusion, you'd see uh, a mix of these structures adds great value to moving the country from the tight position it's in at the moment in terms of capital, and it creates a sizable capital, uh, sizable capital opportunities that could be directed towards critical sectors of the economy and help package and transfer risk in a way that could meet uh, investors' appetite. I hope, I hope this provides you with a bit of an answer. Moving the country from the Thai position that uh, that's 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 really good express now back to miss nina nina i'll start with moving the country from from this time as you've been recent to paris event what's your take on potential flow into the energy sector and in particular and how do you see the sudanese private sector developing in the coming era and you can always r rely on uh, on much this two billion those uh, we, we are expected to be bombed in the, into the uh, economy. Uh, 
Thanks, Rami. So I think, you know, I think there was a lot of um, excitement around Paris and somehow there was this idea that kind of this conference was going to just drive FDI into the economy. I mean, I think first and foremost, it's worth remembering that actually it was very much a, a debt relief conference, in my view. I mean, it was a it was a public uh, for, the, for the public sector uh, and dealing mostly with the government debt. I think it was very good of the French to attach on uh, a private sector investor, investment conference as a sort of coming out for Sudan. But I do very much see it as that. It was the introduction or the reintroduction of Sudan into the uh, global economy. It was setting the stage. It was reminding people of what Sudan's potential can be, especially from the, from the resources side, in terms of agriculture, in terms of mining, in terms of all these different sectors, um, and, and of course, ICT. Um, I do not actually envisage that off the back of that, you're going to have strong uh, flows, sudden rapid flows of FDI into the country. I don't think that's how it works. I think what, what Majdi said was right. We have a lot of rebuilding of the economy to do to make sure it's actually in a position, you know, first to, to be able to, you know, I think there's a lot of, the, the Sudanese private sector is actually very vibrant. Um, we, we are very entrepreneurial people. Uh, and I, I think this is, gives us an advantage vis-a-vis -vis other countries um, that are going through difficult transitions, because I think if, if the Ministry of Finance um, and the new government does succeed in sort of reshaping some of the, the building blocks that we need to have a solid economy, uh, I think actually the, the first beneficiaries will be and should be the local private sector. Um, and I, I think that, that will very much be the case. Uh, once, once the private sector is able to flourish, the local private sector, then I think that will make room um, uh, and, and sort of lay, lay, build the trust perhaps then for, for, for incoming um, investors. This, there's one exception to this, which is I think in the mining sector actually, but, but that's very specific, mining and, and energy, where actually you don't have um, many private sector companies, local private sector companies operating in, in, in those sectors in an organized fashion. Uh, and so those, I think, uh, and because those require very large capital and, and a, a huge amount of technology, which we don't have in country, I think those you will see a lot of um, uh, new companies uh, from abroad coming into. But but for the rest, I, I would agree with Majdi's um, uh, or the Minister of Finance's approach that actually first we have to strengthen the environment for the local private sector. Have I frozen or has Rami frozen? I can hear you, Mina. Um, uh, maybe I'll do it on the wrong side. I think we may have, we may have. Um, I'll just keep talking until Rami, Rami comes back on. But but just in essence on Paris, um, you know, I think I, it was it was very interesting to see who was there. I think we will see some, I'm hoping we will see some some French conglomerates possibly coming in this year, uh, perhaps in, in the infrastructure and key spaces like that. Um, obviously, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of the, uh, the conference was, I mean, it was hosted by the French, so it makes sense that some of their companies would be the first movers here. It also, I think, re-encouraged those businesses that have either been eyeing Sudan or have started placing footprints in Sudan, such as GE or Baker Hughes or, um, or Siemens, who have been here for a while, to kind of continue their efforts in country. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone else has anything to chip in on Paris, whilst we're waiting for, uh, for Rami to get back on, or to ask me any questions on Paris. So Nina, yeah, you mentioned the uh, mining sector. Um, uh, you know, is it what sector of the mining sector is it like for gold or for uh, you know, yeah, for chrome or which? Is there any specific part of mining or uh, generally? I prefer actually when it comes to the mining sector, I think the more the more um, the easier way to think about it or to divide it up is not between the different types of metals. Um, it's actually between sort of what we have at the moment, which is either artisanal mining or karta, um, like the, the tailings, so sort of um, semi semi uh, proper mining, but not really, versus actual proper mining where you build a mine using you know up to date technology, and then that's kind of a very formal concession process, and then the proceeds of that all very formally come into uh, into the the coffers of the state, and then you know sort of filter through, and you have a lot of employment, and it's all it's all mm -hmm. very organized and structured. So. I think it matters less which minerals. To be honest, on most, very little of the country's natural mineral resources have been tapped other than gold. Even gold, I would say, we're, we're really just skimming the surface um, and actually doing a lot of damage in the process of doing it because we're focusing very much on small scale or artisanal mining. And so what we really need to see, if we want to see the country get the benefit of these rich natural resources, be it for gold or chrome or for anything, 
is to shift away from those ways which we are currently running the mining sector into proper mining um, where you have where it's done in organized fashion where there's high csr standards um, esg standards uh, where there's actually a return to the local communities and to the country because right now unfortunately uh, there's very little return coming into uh, to, to the rest of the country from the mining that's taking place hmm. yeah i think that's uh that's really, really important point uh, that the mining sector really does need to be well managed. And that's part of the issue of investment in Sudan is that we've been you know, locked out of some of the best technologies. Um, and you know, mining, if done properly, has high margins. Um, and you know, there are a few sectors like mining that can attract FDI even in uncertain times. The other ones would be ones where fixed costs are low uh, because this fixed costs are what you put at risk in order to get started. You know, um, it's, it's sometimes first movers would include, for example, mobile phones, but we already have three mobile operators that so would go there, but there are a lot of asset light technology investments that could be attractive even in high risk times. Um, I would also say those that, um, I think we're probably gonna get to this later in the conversation, but those companies that can offer uh, an investor market access at reasonably low cost in markets that are underserved. So that's why I think the financial sector would be attractive given that um, you need a license, you need a franchise, you need a network, but um, capital, capital is scarce in the sector. So somebody would come in with technology and capacity to serve, for example, now conventional banking would you know this would be an attractive market as we work through the restructuring process for sure great yeah we uh Miguel, i wanted to ask you about the uh, restructuring the banks um is there does the ministry has a plan to restructure the the different banks that we have in sudan well it's uh so the 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 financial sector primarily the Review the Central Bank of Sudan, obviously with the with the various processes working through now with the World Bank and with the IMF and um, the general partnership between uh, CBOS and the Ministry. Yeah, so the, what's happening right now, after a series of stress tests have been done, is that there's asset quality reviews happening of the of the major banks, which would give a signal to each of those banks what they would need to do in order to reach um, adequate levels of being able to grow safely and serve the market. Um, the, the central bank is also introducing a new business, a new regulation, a new basically the Banking Act, which includes a new resolution framework. That resolution framework sends a signal of what the banks actually have to do to go through this process. Those asset quality reviews are happening and they're, you know, we've already gone through phase one and it's going through phase two right now with the next, the next set of banks. But I mean, there's much more going on and, uh, and maybe I'm not sure how much there's people aware, but the central bank is redoing its supervision framework. Uh, I mentioned conventional banking. I mentioned uh, there's a new central bank act. So it's becoming more independent, focusing more on its, in its core mandates. Um, I think that the, 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 the supervision framework going, going to risk-based supervision is actually a, is a big deal. Uh, all of these things will send strong signals through the system along with what already happened, which is the, the, the alignment of the currency um, to create the kind of environment and stability. I'm not, it's by, by no means uh, done, there's a long way to go um, in the, the capacity and the strength of, uh, of the central bank you know, is key and they're, they're, they're working through to try to also strengthen their, their own capability in all of these areas. And they're, they're getting help, but the, the main effort is internal. Mm, I'm so sorry, I've, I've just lost connection for like four minutes, so it wasn't quite good, but I'm assuming that was uh, the continuum of the uh, Ms. Nina's question about Paris outcomes. Um, now, let me move to Mr. Mohammed Osman. As per uh, what Mike and Nina were saying that since they have both participated in Paris conference 
And currently here in Sudan, we're witnessing a strong investor interest for investment in Sudan, even from other countries. However, there are some market barriers and I think Majdi, Nina, Amru and yourself uh, have said a lot, a lot of about them. And there are risks to be handled investors from investing in, in Sudan. In your view, what are the key barriers and how do we see potential solution as to bridge such a gap? Uh, well, well, thank you, thank you once again, Rami. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a heavy question indeed, uh, and it, it really does require a um, a, a thorough uh, understanding of the market and its dynamics. Uh, but I think one of the best ways to to really answer your question is by unpacking the two sides of the first paragraph of your question, particularly referring to the uh, strong investor interest in one hand and the market barriers and, and risks on the other hand. Uh, on, the, on the first part, I think it's important to understand that money is there, it has always been there. Uh, but today, for example, today, for example, there is not less than trillions of dollars globally managed by institutional investors alone, such as Sovereign wealth funds, institutional uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, insurance companies, and pension funds, and add to that the other uh, trillions of dollars uh, under funds, financial institutions, and others, as Ambro said as well. So the fact is, it's not whether there hasn't been interest; it's rather the complexity of the country's overall risk return profile. Uh, the irregular investment horizon, the absence of solid structures and others that has kept the country isolated. On top of that, add the embargoes imposed due to the deeds of the previous regime. Now, uh, let's look at the other side of the equation. The opportunity in Sudan have always been there as well. Uh, but over the years, those opportunities became surrounded and in fact guarded by uh, excessive market barriers and compounded risks that investors can't really tolerate. Uh, to name a few, the free fall of the currency, political risk, policy risk, liquidity risk, security risk, uh, extreme volatility in market risk, and the list keeps going on. And then you look at uh, actual investment opportunities in various sectors, um, and then you keep adding different layers and shades of risk uh, on top of what we mentioned. So ultimately, I, I believe this pushed the whole country and the opportunities available to an extremely tight position where there is very few, an extremely limited type of capital uh, that could be available to the country. Uh, so therefore, to really understand how to bridge the gap, we really need to carefully look at and examine each side, the investors and, and how money moves in one hand, um, and the magnitude of the deep market wounds and risks around the various sectors in the Sudanese economy. Um, and from there now, we may be able to draw uh, solutions and figure out the depth of the reforms that we need, which uh, I trust Mejdi and, and, and the other colleagues uh, at the current government, they're doing their very best. Uh, on the challenges for the private sector, if we first look at things from a historical perspective, you'd see that the private sector uh, have been squeezed for almost f from almost all angles, uh, from the vast shell companies uh, the former regime created uh, that has distorted the local market and, 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 and distorted healthy competition. Uh, to the wide access to financial support, tax avoidance, and the lack of oversight uh, these shell institutions enjoyed. Um, and this not only pushed investors away, but it also created uh, the very grounds for the local private sector to find solutions through um, informal economic channels, as we see nowadays. And, and, and that's for them uh, to be able to sustain. Uh, their margins were squeezed to the point uh, their very existence became uh, strained. I believe the effects of all this and more is what the private sector needs to recover from and seek the type of capital that would support uh, such recovery and then further scale. Uh, I'll, I'll, to, 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 to go quickly a little bit in terms of uh, the opportunity, uh, allow me to look at it from, from two lenses. One lens is how the opportunity itself could be created. And here you can find the critical role uh, the government can play and the advantages that a strong private sector can bring at such a critical transitional stage. Now, uh, the role of the public sector or, or the government, I deeply believe that the government should rather focus on creating uh, more spaces that brings out the, 
brings out the government uh, or the economy from the tight position and, and limited available type of capital in the market overall. Uh, and, and we could talk more in details about this later, but this is where you see how critical it is uh, to have a level of financial innovation, building the right public incentive mechanisms and, and where complex stru uh, structures come, come handy. Now, uh, I think the last thing to, to mention here is that in terms of opportunity for the private sector uh, to raise capital, I believe that those with uh, healthy financials, strong asset base, bankable uh, investment opportunities, and a good level of investment savviness uh, are those who will benefit the most in Helens, uh, and I think hence uh, helping to revive the economy. Uh, the private sector will be able to produce at scale, and this is exactly what the country needs to stabilize its economy, balance the degree of, of the trade imbalance, and also tackle a sizable portion of the currency devaluation that we see nowadays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Maybe from from. We know that the old regime has already burdened your shoulders with a lot of things, but since the investors or investment ability, or even internally or internationally, they are willing to come. And as we have heard from Muhammad Yusuf, that there, is, there are sort of financial institutions, those are willing to come. As a senior advisor to the Ministry of the Finance, and leading the financial and private sector reforms. Can you just give us a quick of some ongoing initiatives related to the investment promotions, private sectors reforms expected to the uh, on the next period, including policy overall and monetary as, as you've mentioned earlier in the first question that you are setting a set of policies Mr. Mehdi? Yeah, sorry, uh, I, I lost you for a second, but um, I, I, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You, you're loud and clear. Okay, great. All right, um, thank you. I think it was a great question. Um, it, I think you were talking about the international organizations coming in and what we're, some initiatives and what we're doing in terms of policy. So I won't repeat any of the policy and other things that we're, you know, we're working on in terms of uh, reform. I think that um, you know, we, the good news is that we have demonstrated the six months track record that we required to go into HIPIC uh, based on the first quarter and the second quarter, uh, you know, the quarter ending March 31st. And, and so the HIPIC process is going, going forward. Now, um, when we cleared arrears, you know, with the help of U.S. Treasury, with the with the World Bank, that unlocked not only IDA, which is the, the largest source of very low cost concessional financing for countries. We also unlocked IFC and MEGA and others. So it's it's it would be, it was very important set of reforms that happened in order to get access to the as we were mentioning earlier about two billion dollars that would come in from IDA, uh, but also IFC. IFC is going to all, planning to open an office by the end of the year and, uh, and also uh, has already has a couple of investments in the pipeline. Um, you know, but you know, as a, I, I, so IFC is what brought me here. So I'm really uh, looking forward to seeing a lot more engagement. Let me uh, sort of step back a little bit. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'd spent a couple of decades in that organization. And so what I learned over that time, I'd started with the World Bank. Um, I, I was prior to that, I was in management consulting, spent a little time in banking, uh, but I had always grown up wanting to work on development and, and, and in Sudan in particular. Um, I didn't get to, I did work a little bit on Sudan, but I was really working more in East Asia and, and MENA and other places. What I learned is that we really need to be pragmatic more than ideological. You know, it takes the public sector and the private sector to work together to develop smart policy that it, you know, addresses the key public goods, uh, public safety that Nina was talking about in the mining sector, but really seeks to facilitate rather than control markets. And, and we, we have a long way to go 
and that shift. There's a there's a there's a sort of a tendency to want to control rather than to facilitate right now. It also takes the private sector that understands that its role is not just to make a quick buck, but rather to deliver products and services and jobs that move society forward. Um, I worked a lot on IFC's new global strategy, which focuses on the role of the private sector, you know, working with governments to create new markets that don't, where they don't exist. And I'm talking about here in countries like Sudan, what are the needs? And they're, they're all clear. There's, we all need much more reliable power. And then we have huge renewable energy resources that are untapped. Um, we need water. We need uh, health, education. Private sector has a role to play in all of those issues and all of those challenges. IFC has a wealth of experience internationally and essentially, you know, what they bring is a combination of finance and knowledge through advisory services. There are already some initiatives going on in the financial sector and, and, and in agribusiness. Um, and the teams themselves, the investment teams bring sector knowledge. But a lot of what IFC does is actually non-financial, such as focusing on uh, ESG, uh, you know, environmental and social and corporate governance, um, connecting firms with an international network. So Sudan's been isolated. And the practices that emerged during the period that you're talking, you mentioned in your question, during this isol isolation is far from best practice. And we need to get our private sector ready to engage with international investors, as well as the domestic, they really expect much better practices. So, you know, if I was to advise companies who are looking to be in a position as the environment improves to attract investment, I would, I would focus on five things. First of all, improve your corporate governance, right? There's, there's no tolerance for these sort of very murky, questionable arrangements. The directors need to be good and clean. The structures need to be transparent. Secondly, understand the assets that make you attractive as a potential investee and as a partner. And a lot of FDI or investment is gonna be horizontal. People in your sector who wanna who want to come into Sudan in that same sector. Uh, so first and foremost, what's your knowledge of the market? What's your access, your sales channel, your data? Are you investing in your knowledge and your, ca your capacity to be a partner, but also you know, at the same time, your own business? Align with international standards in terms of your accounting, your product, your safety, your materials, your supply chain, how you manage your supply chain. Um, understand and be ready to communicate your growth potential. Um, things are changing quickly. Uh, markets are, are evolving very quickly and it's not very predictable to an outsider, but as a, as a domestic firm or as a diaspora who, who know, you know, through your family knows the market, you'll be, you'll be in a much better position than any uh, foreign investor to really understand where is growth coming. But then at the same time, my last point would be to be realistic. Um, nobody's gonna believe the sort of typical hockey stick sort of thing where, you know, it's just around the corner, everything is gonna explode with growth and we're gonna go, you know, 10X right away. Yeah, some people will, but, you know, it, communicating some realism and understanding the challenges and the bumps on the road would go a long way to building your own credibility. So let, let me leave it at those points. Thanks, thanks, Mehdi. That, that will lead me to the next question to Amr Zakaria. Since the advisory and the Minister of Finance, they are doing their best to, to set a new policies, set a new uh, uh, initiatives, and we're expecting money to be bombed into the uh, economy. Based on, 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 on you, so what, what, what do you think that sectors business models you can see in Sudan uh, advancing as the country is opening up and how? Yeah. I think, Rami, in the last uh, year and a half, uh, especially like post COVID, uh, there has been, um, there's been a confluence of factors uh, that really put Sudan in a favorable um, um, you know, vantage point uh, you know, when it comes to foreign investments and they're just putting Sudan in the radar of investors generally. 
So, you know, one of those factors is, uh, you know, because of COVID, that kind of um, uh, brought back the attention of um, countries to food security instead of having it being, uh, you know, global uh, into being local and regional. So we're moving from globalization to regionalization. Um, if we take percent of the GCC uh, countries, uh, they import $56 billion worth of, um, of food, you know, every year. Uh, Sudan is only eight hours away from Saudi Arabia by boat. And um, um, if you take just one sector, which is the, uh, the feed sector, animal feeds, particularly the alfalfa, uh, the GCC imports about 2.5 million tons of alfalfa every year. So this is, this is a kind of a low-hanging fruit for us because our nearest competitor is South Africa, Spain, um, Argentina, the US, and a little bit from Canada. Uh, like in, so, so, you know, yeah, distance wise, we have, and also quality wise, Sudan has um, uh, yeah, a much better uh, uh, competitive advantage. So the agribusiness sector, commodity sector is, uh, yeah, I think is a great sector to kind of focus on, uh, not just uh, in terms of, um, you know, money, but also in terms of uh, policies, yeah, I and mean, just to put, to put in place policies that uh, make it easier for people to get into uh, those sectors. So just to give you an example of um, what the uh, Ethiopians have done with their commodity exchange, uh, you know, they set up the uh, Ethiopian commodity exchange a while ago, a few years ago. They started with coffee. Now they have sesame and, and other, you know, um, and other products as well. But just in the last six months of the, uh, of the, uh, of the um, uh, last fiscal year, the, the amount of commodities sold on the exchange uh, was about 320,000 tons. Uh, the value of that was about 19.8 billion uh, bir, which is uh, in dollars, it's about $491 million. 70% of that, 491 million dollars, went directly to the farmers, the poor farmers. And um, the revenue for the exchange was about 119 million bir which is about almost $3 million uh, just in six months, which is more than enough to kind of cover the, um, uh, the operational expense. Uh, what's more interesting is in, you know, it's, um, the, the exchange has uh, come to serve uh, 2.5 million farmers in Ethiopia. So if we take, if we take um, a similar model and we bring it to Sudan and we focus not on the things that need a lot of uh, technology and, and logistics, muscle and like sesame and all these things, uh, all, the, all the other commodities. If we just focus on the simple alfalfa um, uh, uh, crop, and we just focus on the GCC countries, you will um, have an opportunity to raise the income of uh, Mahmoud and his and his small family that can that only own one acre of land and probably still till the land by hand or by ox, مثلا. And um, if they can produce just one ton of alfalfa per month you can literally raise their standard of living by $200 a month because you know, the, the one ton is sold um, um, uh, FOB is about $250, $250 high zaykida. You know? So if we, can give them, right. if we can give them that access to global markets in Sudan without, ha without burdening them, that they have to have a bank account and LCs and marriage and all that stuff. If we can give them that access and build warehouses in Sudan uh, and make it easy for them near their you know, production areas, just like the Ethiopians did, uh, I think that's one area that we can um, uh, that we can you know see significant impact. I believe um, some of the audiences are from the banking system, so uh, <clears throat> he, uh, please take the uh, the advice of Mr. Uh, Mr. Amro. But let me let me go through like borrowing the be realistic thing from Majdi. I, I, I would go to Muhammad Uthman since you are experienced in building complex capital. And as Bermagdi was saying that, we need to be realistic in order to, to digest the, uh, the funding those we are expected to be here. What capital structure our, uh, on the global level, our, what type of structure that you see could bridge the gap to mobilize funding in the Sudanese market specifically? Uh, thanks, Rami. I think the 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 most important part to to highlight is there is there are very high expectations uh, on the on the on the government overall and and the Sudanese economy. 
and, and, and that, that is basically because of the, the position of uh, the country itself over the years and the expectations of this young generation that went out and, and fought their, for, for, for their freedom. However, there is a, a high degree of complexity uh, when it comes to uh, uh, rebuilding or reviving the, the Sudanese economy, uh, given also the, the transitional period that we're in right now. Um, and you, you can look at from from many angles. I, I, I deeply believe that there is a lot of work that is currently uh, being undertaken. Uh, but you can you can look at it from from various ways. So you, you'd see that certain deep uh, policy reforms uh, are required, and that goes hand in hand with a deep understanding of of where uh, you know the, the the level of of wounds that we currently have. Uh, and, and where the country is aspiring to go. And, and there is a lot of complexities there. One of them could be risk. Uh, you can look at the financial sector from, from another uh, angle. You could, you could uh, then go to the, to the micro, uh, microeconomics of the market itself right now. And then you'll see that, a, as I mentioned earlier, there is uh, various structures that could come in handy uh to really support the 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 economy to revive and, and help the private sector to really access access capital um but realistically you'd see a challenge that is linked to the to the overall uh, risk profile of the country itself and that makes uh, the country to some extent a bit unattractive to 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 various investors who really do have the money um on the other hand you'll see that the private sector is 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 hungry for for capital and basically because over the years uh, they have been focused on sustaining and navigating through uh, all the complexities uh, that the previous regime have been imposing on them. So uh, in terms of structures, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think my personal uh, approach would rather be uh, to see how uh, are we able to create certain uh, fund structures. And those are uh, structures that would typically um, absorb different layers of capital um, and would allow for the government to have a, an effective and efficient use for the type of public funds available. And also, uh, as you know, investors usually tend to shy away from uh, single transactions and being exposed to, to, to direct uh, transactions on their balance sheets and therefore they mostly opt out for uh, structures that provide them with investment opportunities on portfolio base. However, to do that, you really need to uh, think very strategically, uh, point those towards particular sectors that are very critical for the economy in, in, in the current period and the next stage. And that could cover energy, agriculture, and, and all the other uh, various sectors that are required. Uh, but this is one structure that could be helpful out of, out of many. Uh, I think one piece that is extremely uh, extremely important to, 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 to pull up as well is the financial system. So you'd see a very weak uh, and a fragile financial system in Sudan. And I think uh, we can speak in more detail uh, about this part later. But you'd see that uh, their type of support that is currently available is, is extremely marginal. And you'd see a, a, a strong mismatch between the, the type of capital those businesses need locally um, and what's available through the financial system. And these are, uh, I think, as Majdi mentioned, there are certain reforms that are currently taking place. And, and I'm, I'm personally really glad to hear that. And, and we very much hope that they would play the, the type of role that they're actually looking for. Thank you very much. That's, that's great. That's great. Now, Nina, I've, I've, I've recalled that you've mentioned something about ICT during the Paris uh, conference. And as a soup.com is a, a very successful story from your experience, what are the challenges for the investing in early stage as you have done it earlier as startups in general and for the Sudanese SMEs in specific? How was your experience at soup.com since you have invested as early before anyone knows this type of investment? Nina, please. 
Thanks, Rami. Um, so just just to clarify, actually, randomly enough, in Paris, I didn't do I, I didn't sit on the ICT panel. I sat on the mining panel. Um, the ICT panel was very very well managed, uh, particularly the presentation. I thought, uh, from our perspective, by Nizar Arabi of of uh, Go. Um, but if you you know if I look at kind of the experience of El Sugo over the past few years, actually. Majdi made a comment which I think is totally spot on, which is the be realistic comment is really, really important. Um, you know, I think I think the reason that we've actually done, I, I mean, I, I still struggle to say we've done well. I think that we've survived. It's better to say that we've survived, that we've managed to continue to grow, notwithstanding the difficult past few years, and that we've positioned ourselves quite well, we hope, for, for the coming few years. Is this be realistic approach? You know, we we started. Um, we understood that the country was in a very difficult situation economically. Um, and so we started under the old regime as well, uh, and so we knew we had no no support in that sense from from the government uh, in any way. And um, I think you know we kept we kept the the burn really low for a really really long time. I mean, I think when I when I look at equivalent businesses in even in much smaller markets in West Africa. Our, our burn at times was like a fraction of theirs, which is which is quite crazy. But we kept the burn really really low, um, and then and then we we've, we've been really realistic with with other things. I mean, you know, sort of when we're modeling, when we're when we're talking to investors. Uh, you know, I, the other day I met with with some people who were talking about coming in Sudan, ICT stuff, and um, and I went with a Sudanese friend, and and I was talking to essentially his investors in this. And then he said to me at the end of it, oh, my goodness, you're so blunt, you're so cynical. Like, is this how you talk to your investors? I said, yeah, it is. And that's how I've managed to keep raising money, because I tell the truth and I, I you know, I, I address the issues head on. Right. I don't try and, and sugarcoat it, because guess what? Then what happens is you raise one round and then you, you can't fulfill expectations and then you're screwed. Right. So. Um, so I think the be realistic is really important. And that also affects another thing, which I've seen a tendency in Sudan, particularly for, for new startups that, that have this issue, but even in, in more mature uh, companies, you have to be very realistic as well when you're setting valuations. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons that Suka's done quite well is actually we've been very humble and modest in our valuations. Uh, even the current fundraise that we're going through is probably one of the cheapest in Africa, I would say at this time, um, for an equivalent si size of business. But, you know, we're doing, we have to set it that way because we understand and the country risk is huge right now, right? And it is better to be able to get good quality capital in, right? To manage expectations and then to exceed expectations, or if you can't exceed expectations because the environment doesn't let you, at least you've not overpromised. Um, so I think you know the, 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 this kind of the managing your investors on this is is really really important, and I think that's one of the hardest things I think about about running a startup or or doing anything in ICT to be honest um, in this environment. But frankly, it applies as much to any other business uh, I've worked on in Sudan. Like in any sector, you know you're constantly going to be hit with things that are totally unexpected. Um, you know, even if we talk about agriculture and we're talking about, you know, how we can sort of bring the crop to market faster and all of this. I mean, you know, the major problem right now I, across the country is that there's no diesel, right? So you, you can't actually, I mean, the agriculture is dying. You literally have crops dying in the field um, because you don't have the diesel to power the machinery to be able to harvest the crop or whatever. Uh, and, it, you know, it's very, very fundamental problems that we're looking at. And... Um, and this is what makes it such a very, very difficult environment, notwithstanding the extremely high potential. I mean, the potential is insane, not just from a resources perspective, from human you know, potential and capital perspective, from a geopolitical positioning, from everything, actually. Um, and for the first time, actually, to be honest, we have a government that is, that is, you know, I think very much, you know, I think actually the old regime in many ways, they had, they had many, many, many flaws. Um, but in one sense, they were quite... Uh, business or free market friendly. And I think that was that was something that helped for a while. It then was then overshadowed by, you know, corruption and cryptocracy and all of the other things that, that came. Um, it, it, but but actually, you know, I, I think um, Mejdi made a point that sometimes we still have a tendency, we see in Sudan in, in government structures, because we have such a heavy bureaucracy to try and over control. The government wants to over control. Um, in an attempt also to try and stop the excesses and the corruption of the past, they, they see the best way sometimes to over control. But then, of course, the free market can't flourish. Uh, and so that's another hindrance that we've seen as a startup is constant over regulation or an over desire to control um, by everyone and by everything, which which hinders growth quite a bit. Okay, that's that's interesting. But before going to the to the next question, Nina, um, what about the awareness of the of the market itself of I mean, just go through this experience of awareness and what you have faced. 
Sure, as in like how people being aware of Sudan and raising capital for Sudan, you mean? Yeah, raising capital for Sudan. Yeah, okay. I mean, listen, you got any, I mean, I, you know, when I started people, like literally the question was almost like, where is Sudan, right? I mean, it was, you, you were starting from scratch, you know, you had to, and I still, to this day, you've got to really lay it out. And what people have heard then, if they've heard anything, they've heard, you know, Darfur, they've heard genocide, I've heard civil war, the secession of the South, you know, they've heard about the, the old regime and, and the problems that we had with it. So, you know, it, it was always a very difficult sell. I think, you know, you had to go, you had to go in, and to this day, you have to go in talking to investors as in, you start from scratch. Look, this is the country and you need basic numbers. Like this is roughly what we think the GDP is. This is where the population sits. This is geopolitically where it sits. Like you've got to really sell. And actually, I think one of the funny things that's happened over the past, you know, five, six years that I've been working on this is I've become, so I, I, I feel most of the time now that I'm not selling Al Sug anymore, I'm selling Sudan. You know, and, and this is why I almost feel like I can sell any sector in Sudan now because I spent the past six years selling a country, right? And any in every in every format, because you've got to convince them of the politics, you've got to convince them of the of the economy, you've got to convince them of, of everything, uh, of the people, of of, um, of of you know the, the labor, the capital flows, everything in the country. So you know, I think that you've got to really become an ambassador for your country. And I was funny enough on Facebook the other day, I saw someone made a comment where they said. You know, we're so negative, the Sudanese business community is so negative all the time about our business environment and about our country. And what we don't understand is by constantly being negative, we're driving away the people that we need to come in to help make it better, you know. Um, so I think part of it is is all of us have to really understand that, yeah, we, we all complain. I spend my whole day complaining. I mean, Majdi, poor, poor guy has to listen to me complaining like on an almost daily basis. But, um, but you know, when it comes to sort of the outside world, we've got to we've got to show a pretty strong front and and try and and try and um, and try and remind people of what there is, you know, first at stake in terms of you know uh, hopefully a, a you know young democracy, but also like just the potential that's there because the potential is huge and and no matter the problems still the potential is huge, you know? And no matter the problems, I still think our problems are less than many other countries in Africa that probably actually see greater flows of capital than, than we do. You have done good, you have done good. And you've, you've been a good ambassador now. Back to Majdi, um, I, I was giving you a break as the, the second question is quite of like having a lot of uh, areas to be highlighted, but you've had more than two decades as a senior official at the World Bank and the IFC, plus you've been a part of the global reforms and private sector development programs. Now, what's expected for our private sector companies in Sudan to cope with the international community and what would the international investors do such as IFC and other provider in the development of Sudanese market rather than being realistic? What do we have to do? Okay. Um... Thank you. That's a good question. Let me uh, let me let me focus on three things. Um, what what do we have to do in terms of this? If I'm speaking as the sort of domestic private sector to contribute to an improved ecosystem and to take advantage of all these opportunities that are coming in. I would say first of all, and I'll, we'll talk about three C's. Number one is competition. Um, as we mentioned before, it's a high opportunity investment climate and environment. The opportunities are large. There's big margins. And we see, you know, people complain a lot about prices are going high and they're irrationally high. Well, the reason why somebody could charge high prices is because there's not enough competition. The markets aren't, you know, some way liquid enough if somebody is coming in and offering an exorbitant price for something, there's no reason to follow them up. It, you, you'd come in and you would take advantage of that high price to, to compete away that margin. So this has to be a more competitive environment. And competition is what drives innovation. It drives growth. Um, it's the reason why the private sector can make such a strong contribution because whatever sector we're looking at, you know, all, you know, all the major problems, if you're talking about climate change, it's the competition that has driven down the prices of, of solar panels and you know, wind farms down to grid parity or below that, that will drive the, the fact that we will move away from fossil fuels and toward renewables. 
competition in every sector is what drives economics. Um, and without it, you know, that's why the regulation is so important to get right, not to control, but to facilitate, but then to set the rules of the game in a way that the private sector can compete. Second C, I would say, is contribute. Uh, we need to create a culture of competition, but also of contribution. Um, and to some extent, another C, a compliance. You know, if, if policies are good, we should comply with them. We all know that the government can't be, you know, can't develop Sudan if revenues are only 6% or less of GDP. And typically, you know, low income countries, we have revenues to GDP in the teens and developed countries in the 20s, we're at six. So we know there's, we need more revenue. And so at some point, if we wanna grow infrastructure, we wanna grow healthcare, we wanna have a better society, there's just gonna to have to be more revenue. It should be more broad based, but at some point, the private sector seems to real, realize its interest in contributing to the, the society as a whole, including through job creation. So let me go back to that business forum. You know, the reason why a public private dialogue forum is so important is that when those policy issues and obstacles are discussed, the private sector needs to be there to share its perspective, not as complaints. And yeah, there are many people who, you know, who call us up or send messages that complain about various policies, but what we really need is to have constructive suggestions. How can we execute this policy objective in a way that, that helps the private sector or that at least uh, doesn't create another obstacle? Um, how can we design you know, everything from logistics to uh, you know, financial sector to the mining issues we talked about earlier? How can we do so? How can we benefit from the ideas of the private sector, sector by sector? You know, agri agriculture, we talked about it, that productivity levels of agriculture are very low because Sudan is a blessed with lots of land and water. So people haven't focused on productivity as much as they needed to. And changing practices, using improved seeds, you know, no-till or low-till um, can dramatically increase the yields that we're getting on the land. And that's what we need to do. But so there are a number of issues that arise in how do you, how do you organize, especially small scale, smallholder agriculture, which is really scattered to be able to modernize itself. You really need to hear from the private sector to get the policies right. But once, you, once you've contributed, then please comply. You know, uh, it has to be two ways. So let me go back to the third C and, um, you know, Kind of touched on this a number of ways, but uh, let me just use one word, and that is confidence. Um, <clears throat> this is a project that's uncertain. There's a lot of work ahead, uh, but we need to believe in it. We need to have confidence that the difficulties that we're facing now will have a long-term payoff in an environment that's better for all of us, that allows people to realize their you know, hopes and dreams, especially the youth. Um, if we don't believe in the future, then what we do is short term, you know, which may include everything from the kid or not the kid, but the person on the streets who's just throwing a wrapper away rather than, you know, collecting it and placing it to corruption, to lack of compliance, lack of paying taxes and every other thing, because we don't believe in the project. We've got to start believing in that project to make it real. And so that's confidence. All asset prices, all valuation is based on confidence. And I know it is difficult to imagine it today, but five years from now, if we can, you know, we stay on this path, there'll be a, it will be a wonderful opportunity for everybody, especially the private sector. Thank you. Thank you, Omaydi. Uh, it, it, it was a, a really good thing. Competition, contribute, contribute. It will be my, my second, my uh, third question to Muhammad Uthman. You've been a senior private equity consultant 
at the Green Climate Fund, and currently you are part of a global investments advisory and a capital raising firm. Now, what, what do you, you take for, for of the availability of the local capital? And how do you see shifts in sectors such as energy and SMEs moving forward? Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Rami. I think uh, to give you a response, uh, there there is a level of, of technicalities that, that one should touch upon. Um, and, and frankly, I wouldn't approach it from an angle of um, being, uh, let's say, conservative, but rather realistically looking at uh, what's happening in the, in the local market. Um, so they, in my belief, there is a, a, a scarcity in the uh, availability of capital overall in the country. Uh, if you look at, as I mentioned earlier, uh, earlier the financial sector, for example, you'd see uh, an undervalued, undercapitalized financial institutions with some of the largest being at the range of up to three or four million dollars in equity. And, and these are these are very small numbers. Uh, we've had the experience to, to dive into the financials of, of several banks. You'd see a good performance, but but uh, they're relatively small in in, in their uh, in their value. Uh, beside this, you you'd get to see very high interest rates on local currency financing in very short uh, tenors. Uh, that and and I think much more creates uh, more of a severe mismatch between the type of funding available in the local market uh, versus what's actually needed. Now, if you if you look at things from a broader lens, you see that, again, the, the overall risk position of the country uh, allows for only a particular type of capital to be present, uh, if available. And, and we've seen this historically over the years. Um, and and uh, we, we, we see um, a, a strong movement towards new directions that, that really uh, allows for institutions like the IFC and DFIs in general to be interested in the market. And then you'd see institutions as Mejdi said, MIGA and others uh, being able to provide uh, complex solutions that investors would, would really need to come into the market. Now, um, on the on the second part of, of your question, I think uh, a drastic uh, shift in the in the energy sector requires a, a more of a sizable bankable projects with good off takers and this is if we're looking at private generation for example um, and, and and these are typically structures that follow a, a, a typical SPV structure with various types of capital coming into the mix um, the issue here is that uh, from what we have experienced so far that you see good companies with good asset base but however uh, their financials have been uh, hit based on you know the the current market challenges uh, overall. For example, the, the the currency devaluation that is happening drastically, and so on. Um, an example that we've done in the energy or the clean energy sector, uh, we've established an East African Sahel focused clean energy initiative, and we established this with uh, global energy developers and investors. And the aim here was to one originate bankable projects. Uh, unlock foreign capital into clean into the clean energy asset class in the country, tailor local currency financing and support the financial system to be able to provide uh, uh, local products that would meet the local demand for 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 renewable energy, and lastly to transfer uh, these technologies uh, or, or uh, innovative technologies to the market, including utility scale um, storage technologies and others. Now, if you look at the the energy uh, or the public or public sector energy projects, mainly renewables, things become more and more uh, challenges due to several factors such as subsidies, uh, weak regulatory frameworks, policy risk, offtake risk, market related aspects, currency, and, and many others. Now, uh, for SMEs, the story is a bit different, uh, and I'm glad to hear from Nina that their approach to valuation is rather uh, realistic and down to earth and she considers that it's the lowest the lowest in the market i think uh, having been involved 
in in creating uh, global structures related to to SMEs and innovation in general. Uh, the story here is a bit different and more complex. So there is a uh, from what we've seen so far in the market, there's a there's a very tragic mismatch between the capital available uh, and the type of capital they actually look for uh, based on their corporate life cycle or the stage of where, where they are at the corporate life cycle. Um, so you'd see, for example, uh, highly collateralized debt with short tenors and high interest rates for companies uh, that are yet to even pass the seed stage, for example. Uh, while the bulk actually need risk and, and non-commercial type of capital, as just to name a few, convertible notes, grants, reimbursable grants, and so on, uh, then comes the type of uh, regulatory support that they critically need, which is uh, somewhat missing at the moment. But you know, we're hoping to to see that changing in the in the in the coming period. Overall, I think the, both the energy and SME sectors need. Uh, custom type of approaches to their capital needs and that requires uh, in my deep belief a level of innovation and, and savviness in the way uh, their approach um, and the details there could go into more and more complexities thank you that's interesting Muhammad Yusuf thank you so much now back to Mr. Amr Zakaria since uh, Mr. Muhammad and Mr. Majd were talking a lot about SMEs now, on SMEs and startup investing, most of the investors focus on growth and late stage. Why not much earlier stage, for example? I think as, Sudan, as far as Sudan is concerned, just because we don't have the track record, um, if you look at Dubai, for example, uh, you know, hardly a week goes by without um, an announcement of uh, a startup getting, you know, you know, five, 10, 20, 50 million dollars. Um, why? Because they have been, you know, they have been working towards this point for the past two decades. They started with uh, having uh, free zones, uh, and in the free zones, they streamlined all the laws and and, and the regulations. So that kind of, uh, uh, you know, took care of one risk, and then um, eventually they just became a, a business friendly. Uh, 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 Emirate or, or a city, uh, you know, companies like Souq.com, uh, companies like Karim, uh, they all, you know, came here, they established themselves and they became uh, unicorns. They became, or, you know, Dubai has become known as a, a city that, um, that has all that it takes to, um, uh, to create organic, uh, you know, successes like Karim and, and Souq.com. Um, and now just so many of them Every every uh, every week when an announcement comes out, like all the VCs around the world now they're interested. So if you have a company that's set up in Dubai, uh, chances are uh, is going to get uh, at least noticed uh, for maybe pre-seed or seed uh, round, or at least considered. Whereas in a place like Sudan, uh, we are not there yet because the, the risks are just way too much, and we still don't have a proven track record, or, or at least startups they don't have a proven track record that will just you know that will convince investors to to take a punt. Um, you know we see that also happening in Egypt, where Egypt uh, in 2019 I think uh, came first uh, with uh, VC deals. You know and you know only a few years ago Egypt, you know they had yeah sim and similar uh, conditions. They had a problem with uh, exchange rate um, um, uh, unification. They had uh, a problem with uh, inflation. Uh, they had political risk. They had so many, you know, security risk. They had so many risks. But within five years, now you know they top the list when it comes to um, uh, to VC um, attractiveness. Uh, in 2020, I think uh, Nigeria came number one. Uh, but Egypt also, sh you know, had a strong showing. It was in the top three. It was uh, Nigeria, Kenya, and then and then Egypt. So I, I think it's um, we have to play the long game. And uh, if if we continue to de-risk the country and the environment. And uh, I think in terms of uh, the macroeconomic uh, picture, now we look much better. Uh, we have exchange rate unification. Uh, we, uh, you know, the, the issue of the subsidies um, uh, now ha that has, um, uh, you know, been taken care of in a, in a way that's also very constructive. So, you know, we moved from subsidizing uh, consumption to just subsidizing families directly through Samarat. Um, and then uh, geopolitically, we're out of the SST list. 
uh, inshallah soon the debt burden will be uh, lifted uh, to a large extent. And also there's another factor, which is, um, uh, you, know, in, you know, Ethiopia was one of the countries that uh, has benefited a lot from, uh, from Sudan being actually locked out uh, of uh, investors' radar. But now uh, that, that is changing. Whereas Ethiopia just got, uh, the credit rating just got downgraded. Uh, so you're gonna see a lot of investors that are looking to invest in, a, in, in the region that are looking for different alternatives. And Sudan will become just a little bit more attractive than it was uh, before. So, um, uh, so I think I mean, it's gonna take time, uh, but uh, we're definitely in the right direction. That's really, really interesting. And since we are in the right direction, we're all happy. Now back to Nina, Nina, Nina. You've you've always like facing a lot of challenges. You are a female founder and CEO of a successful venture. How do you see private investors and MBTs better incorporate gender across their investment strategies? This is number one. Number two, how can investors support women-led innovations ventures? Are there any examples currently do we have in the market? Thanks, Rami. I mean, so I always find these gender questions a little bit difficult, to be honest. Um, I think I think part of it is is you know one of the things when I came back to Sudan was to just completely ignore the fact that I was a woman. And uh, I, I think if you ignore it enough, then you can convince everyone else around you to ignore it. And actually, it's not something I do. I mean, alone, as in, you know, if we, if we look back to our revolution, I think many of the young women who were, who were on the front lines of it were, were applying exactly that same mentality of, uh, I can be out there and I can do it and, and try and stop me kind of thing. I think it's a very Sudanese thing, actually. I think I think we have a very strong female culture here. Um, I think uh, Sudanese women are don't shy away from uh, from being leaders, um, and so I actually think it's not it's not too difficult to do in this environment. Y yes, there is there is a huge amount of um, uh, chauvinism, you could say, built into the culture. Uh, you know, the, this is this is a legacy of the old regime very much. It is also just the consequence of the fact that it is still a traditional society. Um, in a developing country. So I think this is going to take time to change. Um, I, I think those Sudanese women are a little bit better placed than their, their, uh, than their colleagues in other African countries where I think actually the situation can be worse at times um, because I think we do have a bit of a tradition, uh, especially in some parts of the country, to have, to have more uh, you know, vocal, um, and not just vocal, but more, more, more women in leadership positions. Um, I think from a fundraising perspective, it's very interesting if I talk just ignoring the Sudan context generally, I think uh, as a female founder, I definitely find myself um, uh, sometimes falling into the, the, the you know, trap, but the, the, the sort of the, rep, the, the repeated scenario that I see with female founders and even the West, which is that, you know, I think as women, we, we are not taught to, um, to have the confidence that men have sometimes, uh, so that it can affect things with how we, we address investors, how we pitch ourselves, um, how we sell our businesses. Uh, so, so this does make an impact. Um, I think sometimes it also means that you're perhaps more humble and maybe this in a sense ties into what I was saying earlier about valuation. You're more realistic and you're more humble because you've not had um, uh, the, the advantages of, of being a man your whole life where, where you tend to, I think, um, just assume you're in the right more. Uh, so, so I think, I think it, you know, you can see, you can see a difference in that sense. I, at least I can see it uh, compared to sort of colleagues in other, even just African countries who have been going to, uh, you know, founders who have been, who've been running startups at similar sort of timelines to me. Um, I, I think from an investor perspective, I think it's just been conscious of that. So, one, I'm seeing more investors being under pressure by their LPs, for example, to have more uh, to invest in more startups and businesses led by women, which is great. Um, so that forces them to have to like rethink each time uh, they turn down a female founder, which I think is very good. Um, and I think really just for investors uh, in country and outside, it's just being conscious of the fact that, you know, a woman running anything is always facing a slightly higher bar than a man doing the same thing. So, you know, assess the business on that basis. Um, that doesn't mean that you should, uh, you know, I'm not in favor of sort of people pouring money into women led businesses just so they can tick a box saying I invested in something, a factory or whatever run by a woman. I don't think that's good for the environment. I don't think that's good for anyone. Um, 
but but I think it's just accepting that the bar is a little bit a little bit higher. Um, in the case of Sudan, definitely. I mean, it's very interesting. I actually think women in society are so um, uh, so determined because they they have to fight that higher bar all the time, and so it gives them kind of a, a sense of, of of a fight that they're there. It's a, it's kind of they, they go into it with a warrior like attitude, which I think is really great. Um, but definitely, obviously, there there is a like a legacy and a very strong legacy. I mean, I know. I know a woman walking into a bank asking for a loan is a whole different ball game to, um, you know, uh, it's already very hard for anyone walking into a bank. Um, I'll just tell you a story. I, I sent, um, I sent once uh, we needed bank accounts open at a particular bank. And I, I asked my, my young um, accountant to go in and open an account. You know, he's in his twenties, very nice young man. He went in and he was just messed around by the bank. And then, and then I walked in and, and I, I you know, I literally just walked into the manager's office and I was frankly really arrogant and I got it opened in 10 minutes. Right. And it, there was no reason for that. Like there was, you know, we're not that different in age and uh, there, you know, and, and in this case it was a woman, but it was just, I think it's the attitude and the kind of, you have got, to, you've got to sometimes approach the world slightly with a sense of like, you know, almost entitlement, so that you force people to give you the, the, you know, the, you know, the, the respect that you deserve. But I think Sudanese women are really good at this, actually. So I think this is a country where we will see a lot of female founders very soon. I hope to see that. Um, uh, but until then, I really hope also people understand that it is still a very traditional society, and that women have have um, have more hurdles to overcome uh, and and more hoops to jump through. Thank you so much, and we're really uh, pleased with the uh, startups. Of I've, I've met a lot of uh, ladies that are doing startups, and yeah, we, we are going in the right direction. As you said, we have to forget about uh, being a male or female thing, but anyhow, you've done good. Now, back to Majdi, and I have a lot of questions to you for in the Q and answers, Majdi. But uh, uh, my final question to you today, it will be, how can investors play a role contributing to an improved ecosystem in Sudan, according to you. Thank you, Rami. Um, I think I've just, I would go back to my earlier response, which is um, really start with competition, make sure you're contributing, contributing to a culture of com compliance, but also to better policy, public private dialogue, uh, constructive solutions, to the challenges that we face. And then confidence, long-term confidence in the project that we're all contributing to, um, to make sure that um, we're not cutting corners, we're not, we're not undercutting um, our own future by, uh, you know, I talked about pollution, but you know, as I think Nina mentioned in the, in the mining sector, there, there are small scale artisan uh, miners who, who are using mercury, which is extremely dangerous, long-term pollutant that will cause damage to future generations over a, a, a short-term profit that will simply not compensate those future generations to the kinds of challenges they're going to face because of, the, because of what they did. So when I say confidence, what I mean is yeah, I mean, there are high risks now. It's difficult to do business and we need to change things, but don't take shortcuts that create long-term damage, not only for, for um, you know, for the, the environment or for businesses, but for also potentially future generations. So I really, uh, I, wanna, I wanna focus on those three points. And I think if, you're, if you were, uh, you know, going back to the earlier, earlier conversation we had on kinds of reforms that we're working on. So, you know, as we go through the HIPAA process, and I've been meant uh, to high, high, highly indebted poor countries, um, in July, hopefully uh, we'll have the Paris Club meeting where we will negotiate with all of our creditors to reduce our, our debts. Uh, and then there's a few two to three year process under HIPAA. And then there is a completion point um, and at that point, we should have achieved a number of other reforms that we're now negotiating. We just recently sort of finalized that package called completion point triggers. There's a, there's 
a lot of them are signaled already in what we've done in the SMP, but there's a much more there that has to do with implementing our property reduction strategy, trying to get inflation or the budget deficit down to around 1%, which is a very stable number, which should make much more you know, economic stability possible. Um, we just recently agreed on, for example, reforming to allow a broader range of collateral movables, for example, uh, intangibles, other forms of collateral, which you, know, if you look around the world, most SMEs don't have land and property to pledge. So they don't get access to finance in many markets that don't have reformed secured lending regimes. So we've, we've just, just agreed with the, the central bank and the IMF and others that that would be one of our targets. There are a whole range of others. So what I'm saying is that our reform path doesn't end now with getting into HIPAA. It continues and in fact, it intensifies. And that's what we need to do. We, we need to keep pushing as the government, but we also need to work closely with the private sector, those who want to make constructive suggestions on how we can improve the environment for them and ultimately for jobs, for youth and women. And I, you know, I agree uh, with Nina, we really undercut our own future if we're not taking advantage of the entirety of the capacity we have in Sudan. We know what women can do because we know what happened in the revolution in all of our families, um, you know, all of, our, all of our, our, our experiences. We know this to be true. We just need to live it and do it. So um, I thank you for the question. I, chipping away at what I've seen online and will continue to do so. And I, I hope you put this uh, conversation out there or at least allow us to continue to answer the chat questions after if you can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Majdi. Um, anyone wants to, to have any input or we shall go for the Q&A? Well, I will go for Q and A. And uh, the first question, uh, I have uh, two questions uh, for Majdi. One is having the, is asking about the possible ways to drive FDI into the Sudanese fine tech sector. And the other question is how religious are Sudan companies anti corruption compliance program is there if need uh, for companies to upscale their risk management systems and will attract the foreign investment. So let's start by this question and I'll start with Majdi and I'll give the mic to the rest of the group. Okay, um, I'll try to be quick. Um, so on FinTech, um, as Amra mentioned, we, we have the Sudan Family Support Program that is trying to reach 80% of the population with a cash transfer. And what's important about the program, not only the cash is important to help people cope with these reforms and the inflation and everything that we're, we're experiencing, but also because many people will have a, access to finance for the first time through mobile money. So we're creating an environment where, okay, many people will have basic accounts through their phones and, or, or through cash cards or through their banks. Uh, but most people will use phones because you have only about 15% bank account penetration in Sudan, but you have about 80% mobile phone penetration. Um, but there's a huge range of services that need to work together that make mobile money happen, but also that mobile money enables. All of the business models, including fintech, but also, for example, rooftop solar or, you know, delivery, transport, anything out there that you've seen in other markets that basically work through your phone, you need infrastructure, you need connectivity, but you need to be able to pay. And so that is gonna dramatically change. I mean, we're the family support program, but also the new regulatory model that the central bank has introduced. So we're, we're doing many things indirectly that will create a better environment for investment in um, basically, you know, technology-based business models that require payment. They're, 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 the, the infrastructure and um, you know, so everything from aggregators to liquidity providers to 
different security features and everything else that the ecosystem needs. On the question of whether there needs to be more help on anti-corruption, look, I mean, so good companies understand that, as, that if you're open to corruption, you've basically locked yourself out of the best investors because they, those investors are, have to comply with law in their home markets and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, for example, in the US. If you're gonna play games, you're out of that market. So yeah, I think Lars, I think he's a, put that con question up. I think that would be helpful to make people aware of that. I think we need to do more on compliance on this side um, with the Anti-Corruption Act and the new commission that's being, that's being put in place. Um, that I think we, we, you know, we're doing the work needed at the policy level. Yeah, I think a good complement in the private sector would be, would be good, but more than anything else is awareness and long-term confidence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Majdi. Mr. Muhammad Yusuf, do you want to have a thoughts on the, uh, on, the capit uh, on the capital reforming for the Sudanese in terms of uh, in terms of new projects uh, supporting the SMEs? Um, I think look to unlock uh, all these critical markets in the country. Uh, you 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 really need to. Uh, th there is various angles that you really need to address, uh, and this is uh, not really to 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 let's say uh, uh, have it survive, but but to really be able to unlock a market in a way that really helps the overall economy. Um, and 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 to really do that, you 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 know you really need to understand realistically uh, where the market is. Uh, what's available in it in terms of those solutions or, or capital solutions that are available for, for these startups. You really need to understand uh, the various issues surrounding those startups um, and what the investors uh, or in general, you know, what can be, what could be tailored locally and, and be available for, for SMEs or startups in general to push them particularly to, to, to or to push them to a point where, uh, then when the country opens up, there is a level of, uh, there's further support that could be available. Like, for example, um, I, I really think in addition to, to what uh, Megdi just mentioned, you need, um, you, you need, I think, certain, certain type of support that would really push uh, uh, people to be able to, to let's say, uh, one, have uh, not to be heavily dependent on, on, on family support programs in the near future, but rather push them into, into uh, a position where they're able to, to you know, find jobs, sustain, uh, generate their own income, and so on and so forth. And that, and that really requires you know, the private sector overall to be heavily engaged. Uh, for startups and SMEs in, in particular, um, I think the current private, the local private sector uh, in, in the Sudanese economy should play a big role. Um, there, is, there is extremely high expectations in the way they approach startups overall. Um, there is, uh, you know, typically there is high perceived risk whenever you look at startups, but at the same time, you know, you, you need to uh, approach uh, the SME sector in specific in a way that, you know, would allow uh, those startups to be, uh, uh, you know, investment ready to a certain extent. And you, and you don't really see that. If you have a startup, for example, from, from my own experience and seeing, uh, you know, different people with startups, uh, the, the, when they climb up the ladder and, and look for capital locally, you know, they're always struck by uh, the type of capital that either would push them out from their venture soon or, you know, the type of capital that they wouldn't really be able to observe. Uh, both on the equity side or the debt side, and, and, and that really need to look at thoroughly. And then, the last the last bit that I think is is crucial is the financial system playing a, a crucial role in in unlocking certain sectors locally. Like for example, 
um, at homes to be able to adopt, uh, or, or in general, let's say small scale uh, or small uh, holder farmers, uh, for them to be able to, uh, you know, set up panels uh, and inverters and so on and, and, and shift from diesel to solar, they need money. And then, you know, you look at the, the type of, you know, products that are available from the financial institutions and, and you'd see that it's sometimes, you know, it, it really, it really mismatches the type of uh, patient capital that is usually required uh, with the level of collateral and high interest rates that really pushes uh, back most of these sectors from, from nourishing. So you really need to have a combination of, of different tactics and approach, approaches, both from a local market perspective and then see you know, what could be uh, pulled into the Sudanese market from a global uh, perspective. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you so much. Now, uh, Amr, we have uh, two questions that uh, I'll start with number one. The one, uh, number one is saying, where are we now with regards to the gold exchange and other commodity exchange? And the other one was mentioning the uh, the, the, the part where you said that the commodities exchange for crops. So they want to know the, uh, he's asking, if, is it a long process to build, regulate and develop? Which parties in your experience and understanding are required to be involved? Thank you. So in terms of the, the, first, the first part of the question, uh, the gold exchange, uh, I think uh, probably Migdi would be the better person to answer that because um, uh, the, uh, the the Ministry of Finance, they uh, I think they oversee the um, the Khartoum Stock Exchange and and the uh, and the regulators as well. However, I, I heard that it's moving forward, that it has been approved, um, and that it will move forward uh, soon. Uh, regarding the commodity exchange, um, you know, it, depending on the crop, but usually it doesn't take the, it doesn't take a lot of investments. Uh, you know, it doesn't take a lot of startup capital to get it to get it up and running, especially if it's a low um, um, if it's a low maintenance crop, such as like the feed. Uh, if we start with just feed and feed crops, uh, like the alfalfa, for example. So I visited a um, a big alfalfa exporter in Oregon uh, in the U.S., and I've seen their facilities. They export millions of dollars worth of alfalfa to uh, Japan mostly. Um, you, you know, the the facility was just a big warehouse. And uh, they had one machine to, you know, compress and double compress, uh, one machine to wrap, and one machine, small machine, the size of maybe just a microwave, uh, to test the, the protein content uh, in the um, um, uh, in the alfalfa. So the idea would be to have, let's say, you know, to start with like five, six, seven uh, warehouses throughout Sudan, uh, through uh, you know near uh, the big uh, cooperatives. Um, uh, or near, near the big cities where uh, they're known to you know, grow such a crop. And then um, you can use the same infrastructure that we have, which is the Khartoum Stock Exchange, for example. Uh, you have the Khartoum Stock Exchange opens only for a few hours. Uh, you, can, you can have extended hours and you can have the, bro the existing uh, brokerage firms uh, double as uh, both uh, equities, like uh, for uh, stocks, as well as commodities. Uh, the idea is to have the buyers who are mostly going to be located in the GCC uh, countries, literally just have direct access, direct market access to our markets there. If they're sitting in, let's say, Abu Dhabi or Qatar or Saudi, they can, they can, uh, they, they can see the prices and they can see the um, uh, the inventory and they can order directly uh, you know, to buy alfalfa from their local broker in Sudan. And of course, that means that they will have bank accounts in Sudan and they will have also their foreign uh, uh, currency in Sudan as well. So um, uh, you know, such a such a, an exchange, uh, it's a, a low-tech exchange. Uh, you know, we can get it up and running with a, just a few million dollars, maybe five or or six million dollars, just like the Ethiopians did with the with the coffee exchange. And the good thing is, it is going to have a um, um, a fantastic multiplier effect. You know, you will get, you know, anywhere where you place a warehouse, you will have um, uh, delivery trucks, you will have people working, you will have. Uh, 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 yani, uh, uh, maybe uh, hospitality industry and um, and um, uh, yani, just, it will just stimulate a lot more than just uh, the uh, the agricultural sector. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Mr. Majdi, about the gold exchange. 
Um, I actually haven't worked closely on it, uh, so I, I don't want to mislead anybody. I don't really have a huge amount of insights. I think price discovery is, is a big part of it, as uh, Ahmed was saying. I also think uh, ultimately, you know, and this is just more my view, I think uh, we do need to get our, our refinery uh, to the point where we can get certif certification done here in Sudan rather than have to ship it and get certification in other places. So uh, I think the combination of different solutions are needed to make this work. But really, to be honest with you, I don't wanna, I don't wanna speak policy in the area that I don't know. Right, if I, if I can just add to that, um, um, Rami. Sure. Sure. So, so for us to have an exchange in Sudan right now without having a refinery that is um, that is globally accredited, um, it you know it really kind of um, uh, we will not realize the full capacity of having of the advantage and the full advantage of having an exchange in the country. However, Understood. yeah. However, having an exchange in the country, you will only allow kind of small miners uh, to be able to kind of sell their um, their their, their uh, production. Uh, directly on the exchange uh, for the best price. Uh, so instead of just having to go through maybe you know Simsar or a, a middleman yeah, um, and lose most of the value uh, there. So that's kind of the advantage of the exchange without having a, an accredited uh, refinery in the country. Uh, Rami, I have, I, have, I have a question for, for Mehdi. Uh, Mehdi, Mehdi, uh, the the effects of we know that the U.S. embargoes were lifted, but the ones coming from the EU side and how they're pushing the the uh, financial institutions in the EU not to have any, well, let's say, uh, very specific financial institutions that that we have seen uh, open to to transfer funds or receive funds from Sudan, um, and I think it's it's been a, an extremely painful process for, for a lot of investors that we've seen. Uh, have you experienced, you know, such, or is there any any information or knowledge on, on whether there's any solutions to that side as well? Thank you. I think uh, you're referring to the fact that we still haven't gotten a lot of correspondent relationships with our banking se sector or sort of the over- uh, n no, because because um, you know th th there are there are certain EU sanctions imposed until now, and and these are related to 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 arm arm deals in particular. However, we've seen in multiple cases that banks shy away whenever there is uh, a a particular transaction linked to Sudan, or if a, a particular corporate or an investor has. Uh, let's say certain investment uh, opportunities in the country, um, and, and it can go as far as certain bank accounts being being closed for these companies. Um, yeah, yeah okay. and th that, that's yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I so um, so yes, sanctions were lifted, and then we got off the list of state sponsors of terrorism because all of the work that had happened before. Um, Actually, sanctions were lifted by the Obama administration. SSTL came off in December under the Trump administration, linked in part to the Abraham Accords. But the main point in the financial sector is it's very difficult to open a commercial or correspondent banking relationship only because it's, you know, it's now legal to do that, right? But that's a commercial decision. So it's a commercial decision that every bank has to make to say, is the business of uh, doing business with Sudan as a bank, opening up those commercial or correspondent relationships um, worth the risk? Um, and part of that is the banks themselves showing up as a good potential counterparty, um, developing their accounting systems, getting their capitalization up, but also the AML CFT issue, so anti money money laundering, countering financing of terrorism, AML CFT. So AML CFT is a technology driven question. I mean, there's a lots of transactions that go through any bank at any moment. And you can't sort of do this without 
technology that raises the, you, 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 you develop the flags that might be associated with a probable or problem transaction and you target and scrutinize those rather than try to sort of manually screen every transaction. These kind of technology investments, some of the banks are making, some others still have to make. And once we've, you know, and the government is also doing work, there's certain um, inspections that the government has to do to make sure people are complying. All of those investments have been part of the SMP and will continue to be part of the extended credit facility. Um, but it is really up to us to make the commercial case to those banks out overseas that being a correspondent with Sudan is A, safe, and B, makes business sense. And I think it's going to be a matter of time. I also think we in the government can do more, for example, by you know, developing a relationship or transferring some of the money that's coming through the World Bank and, and, and others through, for example, the New York Fed, which sends a signal to the money center banks in New York um, that you know, Sudan is open for business and it's, uh, you know, we're, we're going to work through those, those issues. Uh, yeah, that, that, please, please, please. Uh, I think, I think it's really, it's really rich to, to have a, a back and forth sort of a discussion of, uh, you know, we've seen transactions flowing, uh, between the U.S. and Sudan, but then still, you know, these experiences that I'm mentioning are, are very recent. And, and in fact, I really feel like more work needs to happen to really understand where things are. And to some banks, you know, even mentioning Sudan uh, or having a transaction or flow of, of re or reflows of capital from the country, you know, gets to have, uh, you know, very critical and severe approaches from these banks. Um, but thank you, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Now, uh, one of the major uh, files being uh, represented in uh, Paris conference was the transportation sector. I have one question for a uh, person who's asking, can I invest in transportation sector um, and bring new technologies nina can you can you just highlight us on this sure actually i just wrote a response to this i mean listen i think i think i think investment in public transportation is key um you know we saw this was one of the first things ethiopia did once it started opening up and, and i think it's essential here i think actually it's become quite urgent as well um you know, public transport is a mess. Um, it's either missing in huge swaths of the country or it's um, it's quite disorganized and very chaotic and unreliable in Khartoum. Uh, the end result is that as soon as a business starts reaching a certain scale, it ends up basically having to provide its own transportation to its employees to get them back and forth to the office on time. This is one, very costly, two, a huge waste of fuel. And actually, I just think no longer sustainable. Um, with, with the rising fuel prices, which which is correct. I mean, we had to raise fuel prices because we cannot keep subsidizing fuel. I mean, it's one of the last few countries in the world that is, is subsidizing fuel. It's 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 ridiculous. Um, but but the solution needs to be a, a you know viable public transportation system. So I think we do need to invest. And there has been some work done. Um, you know, I think the buses, the bus system was a little bit refurbished. Uh, some of the trains were, were, they got them moving, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. I think we need trams. I, I you know, I think we just need a more organized uh, public transport system. And I think if people, or if the government wants to work on, on kind of subsidizing uh, that sector, the better way is through some sort of transport cards for students and, and elderly people, for example, or the, or, or poorer classes rather than, um, through through sort of direct commodity subsidies which uh, which i mean basically are paying for land cruisers for the rich frankly so yes i mean i think i think definitely innovation um and just generally investment in the in the public transportation system across the country i mean not just in Car I'm, I'm thinking of khartoum and the urban mess but actually like i could mention at the beginning there's huge parts of the country that you can't even access uh so so we really have to work on transportation um and i i think anyone who, who has any expertise in that or can bring any investment to there should be on the ground in Sudan right now talking to the relevant ministers uh, and trying to get something done. Thank you so much, Nina, for, for such a good uh, answer. Now, I'm, I'm done with the questions, but I have a question from Mohamed al that he's, he's arguing that no, still, uh, this, uh, the sanction is still applied. 
and all technology are banned. Um, Majdi, can you tackle this question, if you don't mind? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think there are still a lot of companies that do not know that the, that the sanctions are off. I mean, just last week, uh, last Wednesday, another notice went out from OFAC to make things even more clear. But no, um, you know, it wasn't, it was, for example, we, we working with the Commerce Department and, and the, um, uh, or the Special Envoy's Office, you know, we had reached out to Microsoft and Zoom and a few others to make, make it easier for Sudanese to access uh, those, those technologies, even though they were legal already, those companies' lists still had Sudan on the banned list. So there needs to be sort of proactive action taken by, by firms, and, and you know, it's in our interest to make people aware. So I think we need to do more outreach. Um, but no, as far as I know, um, there is, it's not the case that all technologies are banned for Sudan. If uh, the questioner wants to send the regulations or whatever, we can take a look at it. Maybe there's some work that we can do. Thank you very much, Majdi. Now we are all about to done, uh, to be done. I would like to I would, uh, tell, tell me, Mohammed. Quick question back to you guys. <laughs> Chelsea or Man City? Sorry? Chelsea or Man Manchester City? Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm into a different type of sport. Or, or okay, Lakers. Man City. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is Majdi's cue for telling us we need to stop so he can go watch. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but but what, Rami, Rami, just just one last thing. I think Next. I think this is really important, and a, and a lot of people, uh, in, including myself, are are really looking for uh, certain types of information that would really guide us. Um, I'm I'm a fan of both uh, Man City and the other team, but, but this is a question that is really important. I see a question from a, a participant called Hisham Al Mamoun, um, and they're talking about, you know, trapped cash in, in the country. Uh, we know, you know, for example, there is, uh, you know, the current, uh, currency, uh, regulations that have, uh, you know, recently introduced. But then how does that, you know, really impact companies accessing their own money and be able to transfer it abroad? Um, you know, we've seen a lot of limitations, but how is that working? Are, is this considered part of the, the financial reforms now? Or, or you know, are, are, could people not be afraid that tomorrow, for example, their money is going to be still tied in the banks and not go out? Uh, what do you think, Mehdi? I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like trying to re read the question that um, that there's cash trapped in their countries of origin. Majdi, I, I think it would, it's just the question generally about sort of, you know, once money has flown it, uh, yes, or well, flown in, essentially it has been, has been invested in country. I mean, just it, it, it's, it's basically expatriating okay. the profits back out again. Um, and I, so I think it's a, it's a question one on sort of the, the regulatory reforms that you guys have been working on, both from Ministry of Finance perspective on the new investment act, which is supposedly meant to protect the rights of, of investors to, 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 to take their money back out. Um, but then also just the logistics of actually, is there enough cash in the system? I mean, and I think what the gentleman is pointing to the fact too is that if they now went into the black market and bought 30 million dollars, um, you know, on the black market, they'd, they'd cause another crash in the market because of the, of the market size. So, Yeah, I think it's a good point that we still need to further develop and strengthen the currency. So after the currency reform or uni unification in February, reserves are now, you know, well over a billion. They, they, were, they were much lower than that before. Um, and so they will continue to strengthen. The reserves will continue to build. And the central bank just had a currency auction the other day, which, which went very well. And actually the prices were a bit below what the prevailing trades were at the day before. 
So um, currency repatriation is part of the law. I mean, profit repatriation is, is in the law, but practically we need to continue to build liquidity and strengthen the currency, which is, which is now much easier. So you should be more and more agnostic now in Sudan as to whether you have, whether you're holding your assets in sort of dollars versus pounds, because that massive gap between the official and the parallel rate is gone. Um, and so over time, that confidence in the pound, but also putting money in and not taking a huge currency risk, thinking that, you know, at any day now, there could be another huge devaluation if we're trying to prop up an artificial rate, those risks are gone, right? And we need to continue to keep pushing to make sure that they don't come back, um, including the public funds that are coming in, but also strengthening the banks so that money doesn't go into the informal sector because the banks aren't able to capture and deploy those resources. So I think you got two issues there on that that are related. A, is the law allowing repatriation of profits? The answer is yes. B, is there the currency, um, uh, is the liquidity and the foreign currency available to make sure that when you do have to withdraw, it's there? The answer is a lot better now than there was two months ago or four months ago, and it needs to continue to get better and better over time. I hope that's uh, quite interesting for you, Muhammad Yusuf, and this direct answer that you want to hear. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, and, and I hope I, I won't hold you to it, maybe. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be heading to the bank tomorrow after tomorrow and, and, and go through the process. Thank you. If you're, you, you know, you, you mean you weren't? Well, that's perfect. You were still in the informal sector? Come on, man. Well, actually, can I just jump in on this? Because I think this is a really, yes, I, I've been getting a lot of questions about this recently. I've been having a lot of discussions with people about this. So, so as of today, the, the parallel market is, is at 500 actually. Um, and so the, the split between it and the, and the official rate, it, it is increasing and it's increasing quite rapidly again. And it's causing a lot of concern in the private sector side. It's causing a lot of concern on a whole load of, you know, even, even from a, from a small consumer perspective. You know, I, I think I think I, I you know I've been following the sort of the progress of the central bank on this and the Ministry of Finance. There is a disconnect between I think there is a problem as much the hinted at in terms of the bank's capacity to to process the funds that are now coming through the banks. Um, but there is another problem here. And I think part of the issue is also, it's kind of what Majesty said before, that people are not believing in the project, right? We've got a billion dollars of reserves plus, um, you know, the, the diaspora need to start using the banking system, even if it is a little bit more difficult to use than the, than the Hawala system. You know, I think the private sector needs to have more patience with the banking system. Um, and, and I think as a, as a country, we have to be a little, start being a little bit more patriotic about this because otherwise we're not gonna be able to move forward. We have to have more money for through the banking system, whether we like it or not. Um, and if we don't, we're going to continue to see a growing divide, I think, between the unofficial market and the official market, simply because the unofficial market is driven not even by sentiment, but perhaps by, by other forces that, that, are, that are operating um, sort of in a way that is not consistent with the, with the rational logic of a, of a true free market. So I will just make this final point because I really think it's one that's very important. Thank you so much, Nina. Mr. Uh, Amru, any, uh, any additional inputs? No, I just have maybe one last thought, which is, uh, you know, having uh, lived in, um, uh, in the Gulf for the past like eight years or so, um, I've noticed that a lot of people who uh, left Sudan in the first decade of uh, al-Bashir's government are now coming into retirement age. And most of them are like doctors, engineers, um, you know, a lot of them are like high level um, uh, technocrats, you know, as they are approaching retirement, uh, they, you know, they're, they're, they're facing a dilemma, you know, you know, they have a million, two million dollars, 1.5 million, and they don't know where to take it. So, um, so I think it's, um, uh, it's a great time that Sudan is going through you know, all these changes and things are kind of looking better. And if that continues, a lot of this money that's spent up a lot of the savings of the diaspora, especially in the GCC. In Europe, they have different options. In the US, they can you know, invest in real estate in the stock market. But in the GCC, I think uh, you have a lot, of, um, um, a lot of the Sudanese diaspora waiting to kind of 
you know, uh, expatriate uh, uh, their savings back home as well. So, uh, so it's a good time to kind of go through all these reforms and, and hopefully accelerate them. Thank you so much. Maybe the last thing is for you. We are having a lot of uh, transactions are waiting uh, to flow back to Sudan. So what do you advise? Are we in the safe hands? <laughs> so transactions are flowing back from back to Sudan by the diaspora, by companies. Um, well, so there are transactions that were flowing before in much more difficult circumstances. I think what we're doing now is creating, as we were talking about a little bit earlier, addressing all the drivers of risk, whether it be more macroeconomic risk, the external debt situation of the country, the drivers of conflict, um, the financial sector, the regulatory environment around Sudan, the different sanctions regimes, all of these things are being addressed. All of these things create a better environment for Sudan, for the private sector, for individuals to realize their ambitions. So it's a work in progress. It's gonna be bumpy. There's not gonna be a smooth, straight path, but we gotta continue this path. And when we do, I think we'll all realize that Sudan we're, we're hoping for. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, uh, I would like to come to the end by wrapping up this thing by, I would say, like, let's support each other, be positive, confidence, contribute, and be ready. Thank you so much for 249 Startups for such a uh, wonderful session. Thanks to Mr. Majdi, Ms. Nina, Mr. Amro, Mr. Muhammad Yusuf. It was a really fruitful session and I was very pleased to moderate this session. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Rami. Thank you. Too. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Rami. Thank you, Stephen. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.